don't really guess what it is. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. 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 I'd love to practice my German on you, but you'd be very sorry if I tried. <laughs> anyway, um, I'd like to introduce the panel members. We have Kevin Hanna mm -hmm. from UBC and Stephen Shepard from UBC. And I'm from Royal Roads University on Leslie Cape. 
And uh, we've all been involved in one way or another in a project called Meeting the Climate Change Challenge. And actually, Kevin has had a, a similar project that is national across Canada. And our project is really mostly BC. So you'll hear from Kevin next about his project. <laughs> and, um, and then Stephen. But I'm just going to give you an outline of the MC3 project, the Meeting the Climate Change Challenge. Um, these are some of the players. It had a cast of thousands. And of course, Meg was involved, and Stephen, and uh, the project was led by Ann Dale, who couldn't be here today, but she's in Ottawa. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, I just put up this poster um, to show you what the research questions were. How are communities in BC responding to climate change? What are the drivers of innovative action on climate change? And also, what are the obstacles and opportunities? Um, what potential do these um, innovative changes have for transformative change, for transforming communities um, and shifting the underlying development paths? And then, um, how can knowledge from this project be mobilized? And how can knowledge within those communities be mobilized to other communities? So that was basically the purpose of the research. And then we had quite a few um, partners from various uh, organizations across the province. What we did was we chose 13 communities that we thought were pretty cutting edge. And uh, we split up those communities. And I took Prince George and Soup, so you'll hear more about that later. So Souk, we chose Souk because they had uh, responded with a, an alternative energy project, a huge um, solar panel project. And uh, this got them a lot of press. It turned into a, uh, a tourist attraction. And many people come to this tiny community of Souk uh, to see their solar project. And that's the community from the air. And these are just some of the projects. That's a hot water project. And this is the main uh, solar panels, huge array of solar panels. But they were not content to leave it there. So what they did was they used this energy project as a springboard for more holistic sustainability of the community. And so, well, they started at the top of the energy triangle using alternative energy. Uh, oh, that's the. Ah. <laughs> I grew up. I grew up in Vancouver, so I should know this community, but I don't. And I've been delighted. I drove in along the river, and it was wonderful. Anyway, um, so they used the energy project to springboard a broad array of sustainability initiatives leading to a really holistic uh, sustainability strategy. And the chief, Chief Gordon Planis, uh, talks about First Nations leading the way back to sustainability. And so they really see this community <coughs> as a, um, basically an example to be used by many other communities. Now, my colleagues in this project always say, oh yeah, but Souk's an outlier. Um, it's, first of all, it's a very tiny community. Um, secondly, you know, they, it's easy, supposedly, for them to get buy-in of the entire community, which they did, and um, et cetera. But I think they actually provide a wonderful example for, for everybody. And, um, they are a wonderful example of community engagement. They did not move forward until they had complete 100% community engagement and buy-in of the entire community. And uh, who among us can say that? So um, the, the things that we learned were, first of all, the importance of community engagement. Secondly, the importance of leadership. 
and um, also where they are on the pyramid. They started at the top of the pyramid, but they used that to go to the bottom of the pyramid and to um, basically reduce demand for energy, which is where people say we should start. And I always say that soup could never have got to the bottom of the pyramid if they hadn't started with this very sexy project to begin with. Uh, partnerships, they have partnerships galore. They raised money galore, and it was great. Um, and so they led, in the end, to holistic sustainability. Mm -hmm. This is their community garden. Is this a? <coughs> yeah, yeah, no, there's oh, a bunch on there. Okay. Anyway, that's their community garden. So they're uh, they're they're involved in food security, growing their own food. They do trips called the Zero Mile Diet because this is the beach in their community, and they take people down to the beach and they forage the seafood and then they cook it as a feast on the beach. So it's a zero mile diet. Um, the other thing that this has really done is it's been a renaissance of cultural um, understanding in the community. And so they've really got back to their roots in many ways. This is a, um, the canoe that they use for their tribal journeys, uh, which brings people, um, our visitors will like this, uh, from all over BC, all the coastal communities in BC get together in the last week in July, and they paddle their war canoes to a place that is now the host. So every year the host changes. And uh, I paddled um, this year with Sioux, down to Washington, to, and we visited all the First Nations communities in Washington. And uh, this coming year, the host is Campbell River, another one of our sites. Um, so this project turned out to have many, many different benefits for this community. And uh, some of the co-benefits are um, the tourism that they've attracted. And so now they're charging fees to do the zero mile diet and fees and for uh, groups all over the world who come. They're also taking knowledge mobilization very, very seriously. So they're traveling the world. The chief just got back from Australia talking about this project and the benefits to the community. Our second project was Prince George. And one of the major things we learned about by doing the Prince George project was the critical nature of the political support or lack thereof. And uh, Prince George began as a very innovative community. They did an exercise called My PG, that's Mr. PG up in the corner. Prince George is famous for Mr. PG. So they did a huge um, community engagement exercise called My PG to do planning around um, both mitigation and adaptation uh, to climate change. And um, they fostered a lot of partnerships with the Fraser Basin Council. Is there someone here from? Yes. Good, excellent, yes. And, and that was pivotal in their project. Um, but they had a change in leadership, a political change, and their <laughs> you may know more about this than I do, but their sustainability department was completely gutted, and uh, it was basically the end of their innovative projects responding to climate change. Um, so the results of the first phase of um, meeting the climate change challenge, we found basically three general findings, six drivers of innovation, four barriers, and a partridge in Paris, too. And, um, and then we created an action agenda for the province of British Columbia. So the general findings, the importance of uh, provincial policies, and uh, BC has a carbon tax, as you know, and uh, we created the action agenda to basically support um, policy making and to leverage those existing activities. Um, the majority of our cases framed climate change as a sustainability issue, um, and I put the arrow to resilience, because ever since 
I was invited to come here today. I've been thinking about the relationship between sustainability and resilience, and I've got five minutes left, so I better <coughs> move right along. Um, and drivers of innovation, I'll let you take a look at this, but uh, mainstreaming climate policies, um, and the last one here is an interesting one, extreme events, so as being a motivator for change. Um, barriers, lack of funding, electoral cycle swings, uh, lack of leadership, etc. Five success factors. I'm not going to go into these because by now these are pretty well known, I think. Um, this is the action agenda. We have 12 recommendations for an action agenda, including district energy systems, which many of our uh, communities have. have. Um, and now we're in phase two of the project. And um, we're basically spreading out, and many of the people involved in this project are taking the project in a number of different directions. And you'll learn about some of those today. And one of the directions we've taken is these peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning exchanges where we uh, bring people together, mostly practitioners <coughs> from communities, and um, address a number of questions about how they're addressing climate change. The other, another direction we're taking is this giant, humongous indicators framework. And uh, if anyone's very interested in indicators, I can talk to you later. But of course, I couldn't bring it all up on the screen, but uh, I can talk to you about it. So we've identified the areas of the indicators and then the number of indicators in <coughs> each of those areas. Kevin, over to you. Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, so thank you uh, very much. Um, I have the pleasure of working at UBC's uh, campus in the Okanagan Valley, which is um, only marginally drier and sunnier <laughs> than it is here in Vancouver. <laughs> this is a very long and very formal sounding um, title, which actually should be subtitled, Follow uh, the Money. So for Canadians in the room, you might remember the previous government, um, the Conservative government, during the recession initiated a program that resulted in a lot of blue and green signs splattered across the countryside. Most of those signs are actually manufactured in, in the